uh, lesson. We're going to look at First Thessalonians. We're still in that. We're going to start at verse seven, verse chapter two, verse seventeen, and we'll give a little review before we go into it to get the context of the passage we're going to be considering. That's First Thessalonians, the second chapter. Needs to go a little higher. Okay. Nope. All right. Uh, so before we begin, we want to start with a prayer, if you'll. Our holy God and our Father, we come before thy throne of grace with praise for you, our glorious God, our wondrous Father in heaven, our creator, sustainer. We thank you, Father, for all your blessings, for such love you have for us. You provide for us with every good and perfect thing in life. You provide for us particularly the spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus at the cost of his life on the cross, a very cruel death, that he might be our Savior and Redeemer. We thank you for the Word of God that guides and directs us, that we know of you, how to walk in your will, and how to obtain a home in heaven. We thank you for every person who's here this morning, for their love for you, and to come together to study, to worship. We bless us that all that we do today will be to your glory. We pray you'll bless us as we study the things of your word that we'll draw from it, the great truths that are there, that we may be edified. And we pray these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, <clears throat> getting to chapter 2, verse 17, before we get to that, remember in chapter 1, the Apostle Paul begins not only introducing himself and to Silas and Timothy with him, and he writes the church and he, and he praises them basically uh, for their growth, <coughs> excuse me, for their uh, growth in Christ. This is their, their work of faith, their labor of love, their uh, patience and hope. And he's just very excited about that and, and offers a prayer of thanksgiving to God. When he gets into chapter 2, the beginning in uh, chapter 2, right at the very first, he emphasized that our coming to, to you was not in vain. And this is building up to the chapter 3 when he introduces the fact why he sent Timothy there, and he did not come in person. So he emphasized and reminded them that his coming didn't come to them was it not in vain because of several things that he brings out in the chapter. It wasn't in vain. In other words, it wasn't just a useless visit. It had profit, spiritual profit to it. That's the saving of souls and the directing them in the way of the Lord. And the first thing he emphasized because of the message that was preached, he was preaching the gospel. And he mentions that several times in this chapter, verse uh, 2, 4, 8, 9, and 13. And that brought profit to them in the fact that it, that's where we learn of Christ and learn the way of salvation. But also he emphasized that the message, the reason it wasn't in vain, because he was preached the gospel in the way that pleases God. And these verses are really uh, good verses to connect to 2 Timothy 4 when Paul gives instructions to preachers and teachers uh, how they must preach the word be urgent in season out of season in uh, chapter uh, 2 Timothy 4 but here he doesn't deal with so much the word of God but the way that it's presented because we must recognize who we are as servants of God as ministers of God and and that our goal in what we're doing is all to glorify God and to bring souls uh, to Christ and so he mentions that he says that uh, in verse 2, they brought the gospel to them regardless of the persecution and persecuted in Philippi. But that doesn't discourage us because Satan uses the world to oppose us in teaching the gospel. So there's a determination to preach the gospel regardless of what you have to face. Also, there's no advancing of immorality. Or in verse uh, 3, there's no uncleanness. In the connection of that, there are many rel religions that advocate immoralities. Even today, among those who are associating themselves with Christianity, who like to lockstep with the world and blend in with society, now are teaching, well, killing babies through abortions is okay, homosexuality, transgenderism, drinking, or whatever it may be. Well, their message includes uncleanness. And Paul says that wasn't true, the message of the gospel. Also, it wasn't for popularity. I'm not, as he says, I'm not seeking to please men, but I'm seeking to please God. And that's what's conscious in everything that I do. Is this right with God? It's not necessarily what is right and pleasing to men. 
And in verse 5, he emphasizes there was no deception by it. There was no flattery. I'm not trying to coax you in for any false pretense. And then verse 5, there wasn't uh, any desire for financial gain. It wasn't covetousness. In fact, he says, I didn't ask anything of you. I, he uh, worked and labored himself as a tent maker. It was not to be praised by God. He was, wasn't trying to inflate his ego. He didn't, wasn't presenting a, a show for them so he could get, oh, what a wonderful preacher that is. Which reminds me of a story that I may have used the illustration. I don't know where I read this. It's one of the commentaries. It wasn't by members of the church, but it's a good illustration. <coughs> there was a congregation that needed to fill in for two preachers, and so they had a different individual coming each time. Uh, different Sundays, and, and they both had the same lesson as the life of Christ. And he, he recognized that after the first preacher came in, he was people coming out of the assembly saying, oh man, what a marvelous preacher, how eloquent. And then the second Sunday when the man preached on Christ, they were coming out and saying, oh, what a wonderful Savior. And that determines the difference in how we approach. Are we trying to impress or are we trying to glorify God? But also he emphasizes in verses 7 down to 11, he came in a gentle way. He would treat them like a, a, you would treat your mother or your father and, and, and approach them in that sense, that it would be an affection uh, and not a domineering or necessarily uh, a titanical type to idea. The goal was bringing them to walk, as he says in what, verse 12, in a way that's worthy of the gospel a way that's worthy of God, which would be in his kingdom. And I think it's very significant that this verse in reference to the kingdom, there are different religious groups who, again, associate themselves with Christianity, who teach that the kingdom of Christ has passed. He <clears throat> established it, and it, in A.D. 70, when Jerusalem fell, that kingdom fell, and then it began the church. And then there are those who are teaching, well, the kingdom of Christ is something in the future. And he, he failed to establish it. He's going to come again. And he's going to establish and reign a thousand years and that type of foolishness. But this passage and other passages speak of these Christians being in the kingdom now. Because Jesus emphasized that the kingdom and the church are the same thing. In Matthew 16, when he says, upon this rock, I will build my church. Then he tells them, and I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. He didn't switch horses in the middle of the stream here. He's talking about the same thing. The church, which is his kingdom. And we can see in Mark the ninth chapter, he promises to the apostles, there are some of you here who will not die till you see the kingdom of God come. And so if the kingdom hasn't come yet, we have a lot of old apostles walking around. But of course we don't. And then there are passages such as this one. In Colossians 1, Paul reminds them, you were delivered out of the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his son. So they were in the kingdom. And then this passage speaks of them being in the kingdom. In 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, Paul is discussing the resurrection that Christ is going to be raised from the dead, has been raised from the dead, and thereby he's going to raise his saints from the dead, and he will hand his kingdom at that time over to the Father. That means the kingdom exists before the second coming of Christ. Then in Hebrews 12, 28, Revelation 1, 9, both the writers speak of being in the kingdom. So the, there's, it's important to understand that. A lot of error, and it really leads us down with many other false ideas, are incorporating the idea Jesus has already established his kingdom and it's gone, or that it's in the future. We are in the kingdom of Christ. We live under our king, Jesus Christ, by his law, the gospel. Anyway. So his point in preaching was bring people to Christ. So it wasn't in vain because the message preached, it was the gospel. It wasn't in vain because the gospel was preached in the way that pleases God, where souls are sought and God is glorified. Also, the gospel was received. It's not going to be beneficial to them unless they're willing to receive that gospel. And he says that you had received it. And that word received is, means that you believe and accept its teachings to respond to it. A good illustration for that is in Acts the second chapter. In Acts the second chapter, Peter's preaching the first gospel sermon, and he identified Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, who's been crucified and raised from the dead and now sits on the right hand of the Father. And he gives much evidence to support that. 
And so in verse 47, there are many Jews who were part of the crucifixion of Jesus and insisting he'd be crucified. So they were pricked in their hearts. And he had men and brethren, what shall we do? And he tells them, repent and be baptized for remission of your sins. And he goes on in verse 41 to encourage them. And it says that when they received that word, they believed it, they accepted it, they obeyed the command to be baptized, they were saved. And he's emphasizing that the, the Thessalonians heard the word of God and it was effective because of their reception to it. And that brings me to a passage I'd like to look at uh, in, in uh, Isaiah, the 55th chapter, and verses 10 uh, and 11, because it shows the power of God's word. It can accomplish what God intends for it to accomplish, which is to bring people to salvation and to keep them in the faith. Isaiah 10 55 verse 10, For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it uh, bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void or vain, meaninglessly, it will accomplish its purpose, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the things for which it is sent. This is why we need to have confidence in teaching others. And, and souls can be won because there's power in the Word of God. The power is not in me. The power is in the Word. My responsibility is to take that gospel to them and not think that, oh, I have to be so talented, uh, such an eloquent speaker, uh, that I, I have to be able to teach them. Present them the Word of God and let it have its effect because it's quick and powerful and sharp and to any sword. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. Or, Paul says, Romans 1, verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes and also to the Jew first and also the Gentiles. And I think this is illustrated in Matthew, the 13th chapter, when Jesus tells the parable of the sower. And that is that the, soul, the seed that is sowed, the word of God that is taught, whether it has its accomplished its purpose depends upon how the person receives it. If you like the hard soul, and I'm not interested at all, soil, I'm not interested at all, or those who are like the, the, the seed that grow up with the thorns, uh, that there's so many things in, in, in life that uh, you're, it, it encumbers the Word of God, and you're quick to forget it, that you're not really developed to put it first. Or you may be like the soil that, uh, that rises up quickly, it's on the rock. That it's just an emotional reaction without commitment. But he says it's the fertile soil that's willing to and ready to receive the seed so that it produced the fruit. And this is what he's saying. The seed was willingly received by the Thessalonians. And that's what it may, why it wasn't in vain. And finally, in, in this chapter, when he brings out why it was gospel was not in vain because of the gospel message preached in the way that was right and acceptable to God. They received it, but they continued to hold forth to its teachings. And he says they held to the gospel. And even in time of opposition, Satan was trying to, to discourage them. You held to the gospel. You maintain your faith. And, and he says in verse 14, and then verses 15 and 16, he goes on to, to outline uh, the fact that he says, you held to the gospel in face of opposition like the church in Judea. They were faced with the Jews opposing them. And then he goes ahead and points out many ways in which those Jews were uh, displeasing to God. He says they killed the prophets, they killed Jesus, they persecuted Christians. Uh, they do not please God. Religious, yes, but they do not please God because they're opposing God. Uh, and they're forbidding the preaching of the gospel of Christ. That brings us to verse 17. Uh, in verse 17, <clears throat> like we'll just read down from 17 to end of the chapter. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we warn uh, we wanted, rather, to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, or our joy, or our crown, or rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ and his coming? For you are our glory and our joy. And so, here he's 
talked about uh, his love for them and he prays for them and, and how the gospel has profited them. And he says, but I want to come to be with you because you see, just becoming a Christian doesn't, make, doesn't punch your ticket to heaven. You have to be faithful. You have to grow in Christ and so forth. And he says, I want to come and encourage you and exhort you and help you. Particularly, I see this opposition that you're facing uh, that you need to, in order to be faithful to the Lord and be and close to him. And so he desires to come and to, to be with them. Uh, and, and he says, but we, brethren, and we, evidently, those who are with Paul would be Silas and Timothy, uh, in verse 17, have been taken away from you for a short time. And that taken away is a term that's very, uh, in the original language, very strong. It's like one who's been orphaned or one who's lost a loved one in death. That means you're, I just feel completely separate from you and there's a hurt involved. We've been taken away. It isn't a light matter. I wanted to be there with you, continue to be there with you. And for a short time in the presence. And he emphasizes for a short time. Because his determination, I'm going to come back and help you and, and be with you. But he emphasizes two things. I'm taken away for a short time in presence, but not in heart. They've caused me to be separated from you physically, but you're still in my heart. He says, I, I haven't just said, oh, well, I'll just forget about them and continue on. Paul continued to have them in the heart. He's concerned about them. He's praying for them. And he's determined to come back. And because they can't come back, he's, he's going to send someone else. He's going to send Timothy to help them. So he's emphasizing his great love. But he's also going to explain, this is why I didn't come in, in person. It's not because I don't love you or I'm not concerned. It's that I'm hindered from being able to do that. And so... Uh, back to verse 7, in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see you face to face and, and with great desire. So there's a strong, impelling desire, I want to be there. It's not because of, not a lack of that. Then verse 18, he says, therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered me. So there's many plans, he's I'm going to come and come, come, but Satan put up a barrier. He doesn't elaborate on why, how Satan hindered him. It may be illness. There's several times where Paul uh, had an illness. In Galatian letter, for instance, chapter 4 and verse 13, it talks about his illness. He couldn't go. Second Corinthians, he talks about his thorn in the flesh. It was uh, a conflict in many ways. Or it may have been the fact that uh, uh, he was hindered from going because of the work that he has here. I, this is really important for me to take care of as he preaches the gospel in Athens and Corinth that he hasn't been able to come. It doesn't, doesn't say. But whatever reason is, he nails it who, who the problem is. It's Satan. Satan's hindered me. He's, he's trying to keep me from coming. He knows the value of the teaching and preaching of the Word of God to you. And so uh, he hindered us. In verse 19, For what is our hope, our joy, our crown, our rejoicing? Is it not even in, your, in you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? See, because I want to come to you, why? What is the thing that elates me the most? What is more important to me is you going to heaven. That you be ready when Jesus comes again at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I think I emphasized before the second coming of Christ plays a very important role throughout First and Second Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians, every chapter ends with a reference to the second coming of Christ and the blessings that are for the, the, those who are ready for his coming. This is something that we should really long for. When Christ comes again, we're going to be able to go home to heaven. We're going to be in the presence of the glorious God and our Savior and the Holy Spirit and amongst angels and all the saints of all time. For a realm where there is no crying, there's no tears, there's no sin, there's no sinners, there's no problems, where we'll be able to serve and worship God together. It's our goal. As Paul emphasized in the Philippian letter, you know, if I, God wants me to stay here and serve, I'll do that. But I'm willing to go to be with him because that's far better. That's, that's heaven. That's what awaits us. That's our goal. And he says, that's, that is my goal for you. And my desire for you. Uh, let me see. Then we come to chapter 3. <clears throat> uh, 
let's, let me, let's read chapter 3 briefly, and then I'll go back, and we're going to look at the context of this, because the, the, there's a context that helps to really grasp what Paul is saying here. Chapter 3 and verse 1. Therefore, when we, co- we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation, just as it has happened, and you know. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent, <coughs> I sent uh, to know your faith, uh, lest by some uh, means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor might have been in vain. And so, with at least these verses in mind, in the context if this is, is uh, where Paul is, because uh, there seems to be on the surface uh, uh, inaccuracy in Acts and Thessalonians about where Paul is and Timothy and so forth. But when you blend the verses together, you can see. And then also see why he's saying, I want to send Timothy to you. So let's look at the context. First of all, when Paul came to Thessalonica in Acts the 17th chapter, he was perse- persecuted by the Jews. And so Paul and Silas uh, left, the text tells us, uh, in verse 10, and they went to Berea. And it doesn't mention Timothy, so evidently Timothy came a little later because we read uh, that Timothy's with him in, in Acts 17, verse 14. And so they go, they flee persecution, they go to Berea. And Berea, they have Jews there that are willing to examine the scriptures to see whether these things are so and were converted to Christ. <laughs> The Jews in Thessalonica heard about that, and so they come in and began to create problems for Paul, opposing him and creating a, a persecution a situation. For Paul, uh, we read that the brethren at Thess- in, in the Berea escort Paul to a ship, and they take him down to Athens. And uh, Silas and Timothy remain in Berea. But then we read in Acts talking about Paul and Silas is with them. And the text tells us because Paul, as soon as he gets to Acts 17, tells us, as soon as he gets to Berea, the brethren who are with him, he says, I want you to go back and command Silas and Timothy to come to be with me. I think you have to picture this. Paul is entering every place he's going into a pagan society, particularly in Athens. Uh, and there's, and there's going to be a great opposition. He wants support. He wants help in doing this. So you have Silas and Timothy come to me. But then there's also in his mind and heart, well, we had to leave uh, Thessalonica and we had to, well, actually Philippi, Thessalonica and Berea in the face of opposition. The Jews were, and so I, I want to go back and be with them. So uh, uh, Paul sends Timothy when he's in Athens back to uh Thessalonica. And we see this in our text. This is how we learn Timothy's there. Paul says, I long to be with you, so I sent Timothy. Silas didn't go there. And Silas remains to him in the book of 17. But then we read uh, later that Silas and Timothy come from Macedonia to join Paul. Well, the, obviously the text doesn't reveal this, but Silas also, while he sent Timothy uh, to Thessalonica, he probably sent uh, Silas to Berea. That would have three gospel preachers helping them. Uh, Luke remained at Philippi. Paul sends Timothy back to Thessalonica, and he sends Silas to uh, Berea. Now, all of this tells us the importance and value of not just becoming a Christian, but now we have entered a battle for our soul. Satan doesn't just give up. Now he's going to work vigorously to discourage us and to pull us from Christ. This is why Paul says it's so important. For, I want these men preaching, teaching you the gospel to build you up, to strengthen you. And that tells us that we need to be concerned about our souls. We need to faithfully attend the assemblies. We need to study the word of God. We need to grow and be useful to him. We need to, to keep our armor on to battle Satan. It's a war, a true war. <laughs> 
That's what Paul said in Ephesians, the sixth chapter. We must be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might that we may overcome him. We have a, a, an attack against us. And God provides us the armor that we need. When our men and women go into battle in Iraq or wherever it is, they have a full body armor. I was at a garage sale one time, and there was a, a guy just back from Iraq, and he had all of that he wears on a, on a quilt. And, I, and that stuff's heavy. When you wear his, his vest and the helmet and the gear that he wears, but all of it is essential because this is the armor he needs to go into battle. God provides us with the armor. Of course, the armor comes from the Word of God, which is faith and righteousness and truth and the gospel and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God and so forth. But we have to put on the armor that comes by personal study, but it also comes by mutual edification of one another in hearing and teaching the preaching of the Word of God. So that's why he wanted to send Timothy there. So it has a very important message. So Paul departs Athens uh, after Silas and Timothy are uh, up north of Macedonia, he goes to Corinth, and there he preaches. And this is where we read that uh, Silas and Timothy come back to Paul. And this is what he's been waiting for. As he says, I'm, I want to know, I'm anxious to know, how are my brothers and sisters in Christ doing? How are these babes in Christ doing? And Timothy gives him this wonderful report about the church in Thessalonica. And that's what the first chapter is talking about. I am so thankful to God for what I've heard. You brethren, it did not get discouraged. You rest in the power of the gospel. You remain faithful and growing. And so Timothy brings back this great report. So let's go back to chapter 3 of Thessalonians in verse 1. Therefore, when we can no longer endure it. I mean, Paul says, I, I needed them. But this just comes a time when we have to make some sacrifices and changes. So I could no longer endure it. We thought it good to be left in Athens alone. Uh, now, we means that evidently Paul and Silas and Timothy have discussed this. Those brethren, we don't know what's happening to them, and they're facing all this opposition. So they decided someone has to go. Paul can't for some reason. So they chose Timothy. And Penn Timothy, as he goes on to explain, was a well-respected gospel preacher. And Paul had full confidence in him. We can see that when he picked up Timothy when he was at Lystra. Lystra, he was preaching and teaching in, in Lystra and Iconian. He had a great reputation among the brethren. Paul said, I want that man with me. And he invited him. And now he's sending him uh, to Thessalonica. And obviously Silas to, I would say, to Berea. So we could no longer do it. So we thought it to be left in Athens. And left is the word for orphanage. We uh, idea, I'm, I'm alone. Uh, Silas was with him for a while, but he goes to, leaves him that for. Uh, he could no longer do it. Let's see. Uh, the sending of Timothy to Thessalonica, therefore, was, was Paul's way of emphasizing as he sends Timothy with the message. I love you. I have not abandoned you. It's my full intention to come to be with you. I can't because Satan is hindering me, but he's not going to stop us because I've got another good man. I have a man who can come to you to, as well. And this is what is brought out in the text. In verse 2, he says, And he sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. And look how he refers to Timothy. He's not talking about my, my uh, student here or so forth. Even though Paul's an apostle, he looks at Timothy as his equal. He didn't think of an apostleship as a glorified job, a position. He's not the pope or bishop and that type of silliness because we're all equal in Christ. There's no clergy concept in the church. And he refers to him, this is my brother in Christ. Uh, I look upon him in a very dear way. He is the minister of God. A minister is, is one who serves and is useful, and he is very useful. We saw that in Lystra, and as he goes back to uh, Thessalonica. And our fellow laborer, and the word laborer, uh, as we notice that word, when he talks about the labor of love, it, it is a 
a hard, difficult task that you're, on, you're taking on. Timothy was a worker. He was a laborer. He was with Paul who worked night and day, as he said, to make sure the gospel is out there, tirelessly giving himself to that, do that, uh, and to establish and encourage you concerning your faith. And I think this is a great example, again, for us, too. It's not just preachers and teachers, but as Christians, because we should be as concerned about lost souls as they are. We should be laboring. We should be doing all that we can to reach out, to encourage, to build up. Uh, we need to see ourselves individually. We don't have uh, a certain people. They do all the work. It's our work. We're like the, Paul describes the body of Christ uh, as a, like a physical body. It has many members. It's got hands and feet and heart and it's many members, and they all serve different functions, but they work together for the good of the body. And so it is in the church. We have many members. We're different ages. We're different education, different backgrounds, different abilities, different talents. And so we all should be serving together for the good of that one body of Christ. We're contributing our part because what it's like that he said that you can't say the hand is useless. The hand does something that the rest of the body can't. Every member contributes, and we should see that. Uh, and there, even here, if you look in the background, there are people doing things with the best of their abilities that do things that are very helpful. They're sending notes. They're writing letters. They're encouraging. Uh, they're sit preparing food. They're visiting. They're participating in the worship leadership. They're, everything has value. And so don't underestimate what you can contribute just contribute what you can to the best of your abilities with your talents. And that is valuable, whether you're a hand or foot or mouth. So it's a great lesson. So he goes on uh, in verse 3. That no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed this. And while he says, you know this because he's told them. Uh, just as Jesus emphasized, we must learn to count the cost. Because there's going to be a cost in choosing to be a disciple of Christ. It's not only the benefits, I can be saved and be able to go to heaven, but it's going to be a hard road to walk. There's going to be opposition. Satan is going to fight you. And there are things that need to be done. And so uh, there are things, even though you know the hardships are going to come, when they do come, it's still going to be shaken. It's like uh, when Gary was talking about the first aid class, when you apply the tourniquet, how it really hurts. Well, you can tell the person, this is going to hurt. Well, until they experience it, they don't really know what he means by, this is going to hurt. And you're going to have opposition. Well, when we, to when we face it, it's going to be harsh and hard. But because we have anticipated it, we must not allow ourselves to be shaken. Because we're not only given the warning about the opposition, we're promised the victory over it. We're, that's what the whole, he put on the whole arm of God, that you may be able to overcome. Christians are victorious. God has given us the victory. He gave us the Son and denied for us so we can get rid of our sins if we ask forgiveness or baptize into Christ. We can come to Him in prayer. We have the Word of God to guide us and instruct us and encourage us. Even in time of difficulty, it tells us, you know, when you endure that, you're going to become a stronger Christian. And so, he says, uh, I go back to the text, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, shaken in the idea that it just causes you to lose faith. For you yourselves know that this is appointed for you. And it is an appointment of, of, of the fact that Christians... It's not because God wants us to suffer so much or have this opposition, but he knows Satan's there and what he's doing. And he's very cunning. He's very determined. Uh, like Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, you know, to be sober and watchful. Those are strong words. I mean, you, you take this serious. It's like saying, if I tell you there's a rattlesnake on the floor somewhere, that's, you take that serious, you're going to be sober. We had that in, uh, who was it, Elk City? I think it was Elk City. I don't remember a congregation. It's a lot of rattlesnakes in the area. And one morning, 
when a guy come in to open up the building, there's a big coon rattler. And a coon rattler is about 10 feet long or 12 feet long. It has, looks like coon tail. Right in the front of the least large table. And he got rid of him. Some of the other brethren came in and saw that. And, and as you imagine, the word spread. And so you can see a lot of people with their feet lifted up. <laughs> uh, they were sober. They don't want to get that. It's a serious matter to be sober and, and take it seriously. And so we should be sober and, and take this seriously and not be shaken by it because we know it's a part of, of our uh, difficulty. And look at Matthew 10, verses 16 through 18. Matthew 10, 16 through 18. Behold, I send you out of sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as, serp as serpents and harmless as doves. Be, be, uh, but beware of men, for they deliver you up to councils and scourge you in the synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake and the testimony of them and to the Gentiles. So Jesus is, is not going to send us out without letting us know the enemy is out there. He's like, like the police officers, when they go out, they say, you be careful, because someone's out there who want to kill you. Military, you be careful. You know that where you're facing, because you're going to have this opposition. In Luke 21, verse 12, But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up in the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Acts 4, 21 and 22. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthened the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. 2 Timothy 3, 11 and 12, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and, and out of them all the Lord delivered me, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And then one final passage in 1 Peter 4 and verse 12. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials which you face as though they are strange and happen only to you. So when things arise, don't think, well, how come I'm the only one? You're not the only one. Satan attacks us. Now we have been blessed living in a country where we have the freedom of religion where we haven't faced the persecutions that many in the world now today. Even today, there are Christians that are being beheaded uh, and being thrown in prison and treated in harsh ways because, just because they're Christians. Uh, and that's many parts of the world. And it may come to that because there's a great opposition against Christianity in our nation now, uh, wanting to silence Christians, wanting to silence the preaching and teaching the Word of God. Uh, there is even a bill going before now about concerning uh, transgenders and homosexuals to prohibit people from teaching against that because it offends them and you can hurt them and cause them to go be violent and that type of thing, which is basically saying, you Christians, shut up. Uh, in Canada, they already have that. There are many prison gospel preachers in prison because they preach the gospel and wouldn't hold by. And that's what God wants us to do. So... Be prepared, but be all be prepared with the concept and understanding. I'm not standing there alone. I'm like David before Goliath. I'm like Daniel in the lion's den and many other. Gideon before the 10,000 of the, what was it? Uh, wasn't the Philistines. I can't remember the army now. Uh, but God or Israel before the, the Red Sea. God is our strength. And there may be you have to face the things that we face, but we can face them with knowing that I will be victorious, even as Paul was victorious in the fact that he, even though he was executed. And he says, you know, the time of my departure is at hand. He doesn't say, oh, they're going to kill me. It's time of my departure, because that's what it is. We leave this life, we go to eternity. But I have fought the good fight, and I've finished the course, and I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid of me a crown of righteousness, was the Lord the righteous judge who gave me that day, not only to me, but unto all those who love his appearing, who are willing to overcome through that. So, uh, I may have wandered away here. And verse 3, he says, For in fact, we told you before that when we were with you, that you would suffer tribulations just as it has happened 
as you're experiencing it now. In verse 5, for this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, and our labor might be in vain. So this brings us to why Timothy's there. And, and again, the, the emphasis from the beginning of the letter Paul says, I value you, I love you, I'm concerned about you. I cannot come, but I haven't forgotten. I'm sending you Timothy, uh, who is a, a great minister and laborer for the Lord. And that might know your faith. That is to know, uh, indicates a progressive knowledge. Well, how is your faith? Is it weak? Is it falling? Is it, is it strong? And because I know the tempter is going to be there, he's going to fight you and battle you and teach you to overcome you. But as Christians, we can overcome, as we said in Ephesians 6 about the armor of God. And James tells us in James 4 and verse 7, we resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And I really believe, and in fact, Paul tells us in Romans 15 and 1 Corinthians 10, that the examples we're given in the Old Testament scriptures are written for our learning that we may have patience and hope. We, when we see David against Goliath, we need to say, think, see ourselves, whatever we're facing, whatever Goliath or giant we're facing, God is giving us victory. God is with us. And, and you may have to endure it to the glory and service of God. To, and so that he says in the last part of verse 5, that our labor might be in vain. So I, I don't want Satan to come in and tempt you and cause you to fall away. That would make our labor in vain. We're, we're in good shape right now. Uh, but just remain faithful. And this is what we must strive to do. And I think because the, the very fact, he says that he gives us warning that we can lose our faith. He warns us in 1 Corinthians 10, let him that thinks he stand, uh, stand take heed lest he fall. Don't be arrogant. Don't think that I'm too strong of a Christian. I'll never fall away. You can fall away. And, and Satan can just pull you away slowly. Learn the gospel from his mother and grandmother. Timothy, yeah. Timothy was strengthened with the teachings of God's word. And also, a great passage in 2 Peter 2, verse 20 through 22, where Peter says, once we have overcome an, uh, our sin by being saved, he says, we can... I'm going to mess that up. I'm going to read that. Some passages just slip my mind pretty fast. I go back here. 2 Timothy 2. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the last states become worse than the first. Here are Christians who are cleansed by the blood of Christ, who are walking with the Lord, but they let their guard down. And now they become entangled again in the world in sin, and they're overcome, and they're in a worse state. And I think they're in a worse state. Could you think of this? What brought you to God? Well, when you learn about God's love, and you learn of how salvation is in Christ, and, and you know that the, the Word of God guides you, and all of these teachings that bring you to receive uh, salvation in Christ. Now that you've fallen away, what argument can you use? It's the same arguments. Well, God loves you. You already know that, but you've fallen away. Well, sin is, can destroy your soul. Well, you, you know that, but you've fallen away. I think the last states were the worse than the first because it's harder now to convict that heart, to prick that heart with the need to come back to the Lord. And then he uses, for it had been better for you not to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn from the holy commandments to deliver to you. But it's happened to them according to the true proverb. A dog had returned to his own vomit, and a sow having washed her watering in the mire. And he gives an ugly, stinky picture for reason. That's what being in sin is like. It's like a dog eating his vomit. This is not good. It's like a hog that has cleansed, and now it doesn't stink, but he goes back to the pig pen, goes back to where he left. That danger, as he says here, is there before us. And we will fall if we don't keep guard if we're not sober, and if we're not uh, striving to be righteous. So he emphasizes in verses 6 through 10 uh, his joy over the brethren. Because when I sent Timothy to you, he came back, and this was a wonderful message. Because when, just like uh, you have uh, someone who's ill in the hospital, very serious, they may not live, and the message comes back, everything works out. They're regaining their health. 
that's what Paul was. I'm so worried. I'm so fretful. And then uh, I find out that you are doing what you should be doing. So we begin what, um, beginning in verse 7. Therefore, brethren, in all, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you? For all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God, night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and, and perfect what is lacking in your faith. So here's his great joy here in knowing his, that uh, while we were distressed, ah, this is good news. You have, you have come back to the Lord. You've maintained, rather, your faith in the Lord. And so this is another good reason why it was, it was a good idea to send Timothy, because we want to keep that going. We want to keep that strength uh, in faith going before you. So uh, he says, now Timothy has come to us and brought this information that your faith your confidence in the truth of the gospel, you're willing to walk by faith, not by sight, is established. And, and uh, let me see, what is it, next verse, that you're uh, so great desiring to see us. That's not where I want to, okay. Okay, uh, I jumped out of the wrong spot here. And brought us good news of your faith and your love. And love is kind of in, over encompassing many things, as Jesus emphasized in Matthew 22. Your love for God, loving God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, where you endure anything for Him. You're like the apostles. Once they were beaten, they come out rejoicing. Boy, I had an opportunity to show God how much I loved Him. Uh, they were meeting the faith, but also your love for one another because their strength as a congregation was due that they were a congregation of God's people. Did that bell you ring this? Okay, I... I saw a body walk by it. I thought, I did it again. My hearing is not what it should be. And so he is strengthened by the love that they have one for another. So his heart now changes from concern to confidence. And you want to you you leave that alone. You want to build a confidence. We, yeah, Shepherd has a strong congregation. I think we're doctrinally strong. I think we're spiritually strong. We have love for one another. But you know, Satan can come in and just hack that apart. So we must always be on guard. We want to keep it strong. We want to continue to love one another. We want to continue to do the work of the Lord and be a source of encouragement and strength one to another. Because Satan is real and his, his threats are real. And in verse 8, for now we live if you stand fast the Lord. This is, life has really come to, to us because I know you're standing fast in the Lord. It's a joy to see Christians who remain faithful. Okay. We'll stop there and we'll start at verse uh, 9 next time. Thank you for your attention.